Education Finance and Policy Committee for Thursday, January 28th, 2021 will come to order. Welcome everybody and welcome back the you back to the committee. I'm sure we'll be seeing a lot of you. Um, do any of you have cameras? We can see you. There you are, Myron. Hi. <laughs> How's the new job? <laughs> it's good. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Okay. Um, so we're ju we just want to do a budget overview and uh, find out a little bit how you spend your money and how your internal allocations go and and uh, just uh, more of a primer for the committee. We're, we're almost all new members of the higher ed committee. And, uh, and so uh, some of this is informative. Some of this is new and uh, some of it's old. So uh, we would uh, like to get as much information as you can possibly give us. And, uh, and if we have some questions after the presentation or during the presentation, um, I don't mind when members ask questions. So um, Julie, you wanna go first? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chair Tomasoni. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Julie Tonneson. I am the budget director for the University of Minnesota. And I have been asked uh, this afternoon to walk you through some information about the university's budget as you suggested. So JD, go ahead and advance to the agenda here. We wanted to share with you the plan for the next roughly 30 minutes of material that we brought today. I will need to move pretty fast uh, through the slides to hit the highlights in the time allotted, but we will provide an overview of the roughly $4 billion budget, uh, touching on uh, revenues, the things that make up the budget. So the revenues paying particular- So, so Julie, you're, you're the only one on the agenda today. So if you take more than 15 minutes, it's okay. Honey. Okay. It's okay. Okay, all right. I appreciate that. Okay. Uh, so we will uh, focus on uh, the revenues at a very high level, but uh, highlighting perhaps some areas that are of particular interest to the committee. And then we will touch on expenditures. And then the second half of the presentation today is really about the budget process, uh, how we make our decisions on the budget, and we will provide an explanation of the budget model and some methodologies that we use. And of course, as you suggested, we're happy to take questions throughout or at the end, uh, depending on how you feel it's most helpful or appropriate as we go forward. So with that, uh, by way of intro, let's get started. Uh, one of the things about university revenues that not everyone understands is that we are required to do fund accounting. And what that really means is just like the state, we keep track of our resources based on where they come from because there's different restrictions and guidelines attached to those revenues and how we can use them. So go ahead and advance to the first one, JD. We, we think about the groups of revenues in really three different buckets, if you will. And the first of those I'll describe are restricted funds. These are dollars that come into the institution and the donor or the sponsor or whoever is giving us the funds places restrictions on them in terms of how we can use the dollars. So those restrictions might be to certain areas of the university, for example, the state special appropriation that is for the experiment station and Minnesota Extension, it has to go there, right? We can't use it elsewhere. Other restrictions are more based on uh, a particular department, even within the university or a function. So think about a donor who provides gift funds to the university that are specifically for a faculty member's position in a department or for scholarships, uh, either generally or to particular types of students. Those are all very restricted funds. We cannot use them to solve problems throughout the university. They serve an important purpose, but they have little flexibility within to balance the budget. The second group, do you want to hit the button, are uh, yellow okay. here. Okay, stop, stop just for one second. You said they have little flexibility. Do they have some flexibility for balancing the budget? Well, and, and when I say that, what I mean is they are, uh, important in terms of providing programming. So in other words, if we get funding for a particular faculty member as a gift, that means we don't have to use our unrestricted funds to provide that same uh, uh, function or that same position. So they allow us to uh, use our unrestricted dollars differently than we otherwise would, but we can't move those dollars in, in particular around. So like it endowed chairs are an example of that, that they get paid by the endowment and not by the university. That's correct, that's correct. And if it's a position that we really have to have, we then we don't have to use our unrestricted funds to provide that position. 
So okay. in that way, it had, they're extremely helpful, but not, but we can't choose where to put them. Uh, so then the second group that is kind of in the yellow category would be the businesses of the institution. Think about uh, the bookstores and Gopher Athletics and parking and uh, student housing and dining. These are functions that operate, they, they sell a service, they sell a good, primarily to the public or to individuals. And they exist only by those sales and by the activity they're engaged in to generate revenues. And so the expectation in the budget for these activities is that they generate enough revenue to cover their direct costs and some overhead uh, or infrastructure costs back to the institution and that they uh, are mostly uh, self-supporting. They do not generate a profit that then comes back to fund other discretionary things within the institution. The best group of funds from a budgeting perspective, and I'm biased here, and any budget person would tell you this, are the unrestricted dollars because they do provide that flexibility. And here there are really two types within the university. When you hit the button again, JD, I want to talk about the last group here under unrestricted first, and that's fees, sales income, clinical income, and so forth. These are technically unrestricted, but they are generated by departments based on the activities those departments are engaged in. And they're unrestricted to the department in that they can use it for general operations, but the university chooses not to move that money around the institution. Let me give you an example. Uh, the uh, Veterinary Medical Center in the College of Veterinary, Science, uh, Veterinary Medicine, that generates clinical income. We do not take that revenue and move it to the College of Design, for example. It is to support activities and operations within the college and within the medical, uh, within the medical center in that college, but they're technically unrestricted. Again, important and very important for those units, but some units don't generate any income. So it just depends on what they are engaged in, in terms of whether we can access those funds. The best money from a budgeting perspective is the state O&M appropriation and the tuition because that, but that's the money that allows us to basically approach the budget in two different ways is how I think about it. it. In one path, it allows us to take care of the university, to address safety issues in buildings and labs and in our public spaces, to pay for things that our other external partners won't cover completely or even in part. Uh, things like equipment, administrative functions like HR and finance, technology, compliance requirements for reporting and monitoring, uh, utilities, custodial services, and so on and so forth. And secondly, these dollars really allow us to serve our students and deliver on our mission throughout the university by funding things like faculty and their needs, teaching specialists, career services, libraries, extension activities, and so on and so forth. Uh, it provides that extra edge of excellence in so many ways throughout all of our colleges and our campuses. And we'll talk more in the second half about how we decide uh, and where that money goes and how our budget model pushes that money throughout the institution. But it is extremely important in allowing us to balance the budget by addressing needs where they are as they pop up and by addressing priorities um, based on the, the wishes and goals of the president and the board. So that's a very important money. Uh, how that falls within the overall budget or what the proportions are, are on the next slide. Thank you. Uh, so here you can see the $3.9 billion budget for this year and that a significant portion, 36% of those revenues are restricted in one form or another. The sponsored grants, darker, darker red because they're even more restricted than some of the other restricted funds that are here. 9% are the businesses that I mentioned. 14% is that departmental generated unrestricted income, and then 41% sits in the O&M appropriation and tuition combined. Uh, I'm gonna advance. Within that uh, piece of the pie, within that uh, 41%, this is the split between the O&M, uh, the state appropriation and the tuition. So if you just take the state appropriation and tuition, just those two sources, and the state appropriation here does include the state specials in this particular pie chart. That, that funding 
uh, between those two sources, the state portion is 42%, tuition is 58%. And throughout the country, this has changed here as well. This has changed over the years, and you have heard this before, but if you went back and looked 20, 30 years ago, that proportion would be significantly different and it would be the opposite. You would have 65 to 75% of the total from the state uh, with the remaining from tuition. So that has changed and we have become more tuition dependent as a result. Uh, advance, please. And so let's talk about tuition just a little bit, give you some highlights. This first chart here, and this you can have for your records, uh, I believe they, you were given this presentation or have access to it. If you ever wanna look back at what the undergraduate resident and non-resident tuition rates on each of our campuses are this year. Uh, you can see here that we did not increase them in FY21. We froze all of our rates as did many schools, not all of our competitors, but a number did uh, in, in really in recognition of the impact the pandemic has had on students and families. And that really falls very in line with what we've been trying to do. So if you advance to the next slide, uh, really beginning with the 2014-2015 biennium, I think the university began a very concerted effort, sometimes in partnership with the state as well, to hold the tuition rate growth down, really in two primary ways. The first being keeping the growth on the Twin Cities campus at or below the rate of inflation, and to hold down the increase on rates for the Crookston, Duluth, Morris, and Rochester campuses even more, uh, thus creating a larger differential between them and the Twin Cities campus, and less of a differential really between them and the other regional campuses, both within Minnesota and in our neighboring states. So a student here on the Twin Cities campus who had been here during this period of time would have experienced an average annual increase of 1.3%. And on each of our other campuses, a student would experience roughly a half a percent increase per year on average. Um, so that has been a, a conscious decision and has been part of our budget planning and adds complexity in the budget planning, but was considered a priority. So let's move on to the next one. I wanna spend just a few minutes talking about some of the other revenues that make up that other 60%. This is a list and I won't describe all of Julie, these. Julie, this is Julie, the list uh, that yeah. were in that pie chart. Yep, Julie, did you have a question? Senator Claussen, do you have a question right now? Yes, Mr. Chair, I do, if I could. Go ahead. <laughs> I'd like to go back to the slide where it says full year 21 undergraduate tuition. And there's a comparison of the five um, campuses. Mm -hmm. uh, one question would be um, international students, are they not reflected on the chart or are they included in the non-resident? Is their tuition the same? Uh, Mr. The Chair, yep. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Claussen, the international students are charged the non-resident rate and on the Twin Cities, so in that column here, and on the Twin Cities campus, there is also a surcharge on top of that for um, international student programming specific to their needs. Okay. It's $500, I believe. Okay. And the other uh, question I had was that the Rochester and the Crookston uh, campuses, the non-resident uh, and resident tuition is exactly the same. Uh, whereas in the other three campuses, it's not. Could you just comment on that, please? Sure, uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Clausen, the choices uh, have been made over time and both of those, uh, Rochester from the beginning and Crookston for quite some time, that they, if to create a differential between the resident and the non-resident rate will not gain any revenue for the institution because we will not attract the students. Uh, those were judgments made uh, by the president and the chancellors at the time, and they have continued to uh, believe that that is the case. Okay, thank you. Sure. So back to the other revenues uh, really quick here. This is just, um, a listing of what in, in large categories of what those are, and I won't go into each of them. You can see that the largest by far here are the sponsored grants. Uh, I do want to make, and I'll make a point on that in a minute, but before we get there, I want to make just a couple points. One is within our system, there are incentives in our internal budgeting process and model 
for units to try to grow these revenues. And we work at it all the time. It's hard to grow these revenues, but we are actually succeeding in that a little bit each year. Uh, with a couple of, of exceptions, as I mentioned earlier, these revenues are expected to generate enough growth over time to cover the costs associated with generating those revenues, as well as to provide some uh, overhead expense and that little extra edge for program excellence and advancement. So they're important revenues. We want units to have be incentive to grow them and we continue to push that where appropriate. Uh, and second these, point and, I, and these yep. revenues and these revenues can be used for anything. No, nope. if they are red here, that means they are restricted. There, so uh, this is a I, mix. I get the color coding now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, they are. If it's red, it's restricted. Yellow are the business, and green are unrestricted. So the majority is actually restricted um, within the institution, and that leads me really to a second point I want to make, which is the sponsored revenue portion, the largest piece here, comes from the grants we receive primarily from the federal government, but also from business and industry, the state, other local governments and organizations to do very specific project work, either for research or for public service, highly restricted. But the, the one important thing to understand here that I want to make from a budgeting perspective is that the sponsors do not pay for 100% of the costs of the associated research. The university must use our unrestricted dollars that we've been talking about and key among them the O&M appropriation to support research and actually make it happen. The equipment, the compliance requirements, the safety requirements, monitoring and fiscal management, library materials, technology, all those infrastructure things that are necessary to do research depend on those other unrestricted sources to supplement what comes in from the grants in order to make it happen. A lot of people don't understand that, but from a budgeting perspective, that's definitely part of our annual challenge is to, to deal with that uh, extra cost. Uh, you can advance, JD. Within the other unrestricted, within the restricted categories of other revenues, we also have endowment earnings. And you touched on that uh, earlier in terms of endowed chairs. Our endowment right now at the University of Minnesota is $4 billion between that managed by the university and the portion managed by the foundation. And 99% of the gifts that come into the institution, both those that are endowed and those that are annual, that are to be spent right away, are restricted to purpose or unit or place within the university. The endowment spits out about $180 million a year right now in what we call spendable income. That's the portion that actually hits university departments and, and we are able to spend. And that's, um, again, it's restricted. So we can't move it around, but as we were discussing earlier, it is extremely helpful to make the, the university work. Uh, it's, it's definitely needed, but it is restricted. So I wanted to make that point here. And if you go to the next slide, I also wanted to hit um, a few slides on balances because the people tend to be curious about the balances at the institution and how they work. Uh, really, you can think about the balances of the institution like a checkbook, if you will. These balances are really not different than what the state maintains for its cash balance and what is necessary to responsibly run the organization day to day. So the dollars that are available on any given day will vary. And prior to the pandemic, they were running 800, between 800 million and just over a billion dollars at any given point in time, which is on average equal to three to four months of operating costs, 100 days roughly. Uh, they include both restricted and unrestricted funds in that cash flow uh, change throughout the year. They're necessary to meet the cash flow needs of the institution and also to support our bond ratings uh, so that we get good rates when we, when we go to sell debt. The other point I want to make here is that they are actively managed as part of our annual budget process. And what I mean by that is as part of our review, which we'll talk about in a minute, with each of our units, we talk to them about what their balances are, what they represent, and how we can use them strategically at different points in, in the year uh, to make sure that, that they are effective uh, in, in helping us balance our budget and in serving our mission. 
So we'll talk more about that in the in the process slides. But if you go to the next one, and, and is the I also e want to clarify. Julie is yep. equal, equal to go back to the previous slide. Equal to 100 days of normal operations. Is that is that just a uh, an internal policy within the U? Um, uh, Chair Tomasoni, it's not a policy. It is. Uh, it is within the realm of goal in terms of how the rating agencies look at us and what they think is appropriate. So it is, uh, I think we're comfortable with it being at 100 days, but it is, it is not written, I, I guess I should put that way, in, in policy. Do you try and maintain it at that level? Is that what it is? Generally, yes. Okay. And in the next slide, this is the difference between I want to point out a difference between that total billion dollar roughly balance and what we call central reserves. By board policy, uh, we have a guideline and a goal of setting aside either $25 million or 4% of the state appropriation is how it's written in policy uh, to set that aside every year and have it be available to handle things that happen, unanticipated needs throughout the year, kind of a rainy day fund, if you will. Uh, and it is raining now, as we all know, due to the pandemic. And so on the next slide, we wanted to share with you that exactly how this works, because the board has approved now an authorized spending down of central reserves of $35 million over two years. So going in, well, going before the pandemic, we were projecting the, the central reserves balance to be $49 million at the end of FY20. Then the pandemic hit, and very quickly, we had to refund a lot of uh, dollars to students. We had to face additional costs and so forth. So the board approved as part of the budget process, they approved us to spend down 25 million of central reserves in FY20 and an additional or up to an additional 10 million in FY21. 35 million across the two years. So now we're anticipating the balance to be 14 million by the end of this fiscal year. It won't be that exactly, but I think we're on track to having it be somewhere between 10 and 15 million. And that means that we're gonna be below our policy guideline, our policy goal. And so we will be working over the upcoming years to build that back up again so that we have that in case something else happens um, that's that's needed. So, so you, that's might, it. You, might, you might be getting to this, but is, is this an area where the COVID money would go back into? Uh, so, uh, Chair Thomasoni, we actually have to spend the, the federal money this year, and we believe right now prior to the end of May. And so we don't have it yet. We don't even have the official notification of it yet, but we are working on how we can use the new federal COVID money to solve problems that may take the place of some of the spend down of central reserves uh, before we're done, but our problem is larger than than 35 or even you know 35 did, million dollars so i'm not sure yet did you receive any funds from the first covid package mr chair yes we did uh we received about oh, 36 million uh i think is what it, what the total was and that's been spent yes sir it was spent prior to june 30th it was spent in fy 20 half of it going to students as required uh, by the federal law and half of it went within the institution to offset a portion of the loss of the refunds that we had to give to students. Okay. Okay, so let's move on, JD. I have just a couple of quick slides about expenditures. Uh, within, within the budget, this is just the non-sponsored now. So this is setting aside those highly restricted grants that are for research that are often multi-year. This is just looking at the annual non-sponsored part of the budget, restricted and unrestricted funds. And it shows you that we track, well, we track expenditures in lots of different ways, but two of the main ways are depicted here. On the left side of the chart, it shows you that how we spend our money by what I would call spending type or category. And you can see that as an educational institution, we are primarily a people place. We spend 60 to 65% of our budget on people, compensation, uh, salary and benefits. And then you can see the other categories there, which are pretty typical um, ways to, to track the funding. On the right side, it's the same dollars, the same 3.4 billion, just displayed in terms of functional use. Uh, and this, uh, these are categories that are given to us by the federal government that 
all higher ed, ed, ed institutions that receive federal money track their spending in these categories. This does not include, again, the sponsored research. So the research portion of this pie looks smaller than, than one would think, but that's strictly a function of the fact that the sponsored research is outside of this, of this chart and this way of tracking. Senator uh, Claus. Senator Claus in this question. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A uh, question that 11% uh, for student aid, does that include scholarships and also uh, student work uh, dollars that are spent? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair and Senator Clausen, yes, it would. And includes scholarships, grant aid and um, student work, yes. Could you break that down into uh, scholarship dollars? I'm just curious what the scholarship dollar amount might be. Um, Mr. Chair, I actually do not have that with me today. We can follow up with you and get you that information in terms of what, within the student aid total, how it might break down between the different types of aid. We would have that, um, but I don't have it for you right here. Okay, thank you. Let me, sure. let me, let me follow up on that just a second. So, uh, and is the student uh, scholarships, are they merit scholarships or are they need scholarships, merit, merit? Um, Mr. Chair, it would be both. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. That would also include presidential scholarships? Mr. Chair, Senator Claussen, yes. Would, would all, forms of, all forms of financial aid, there are codes within our system that indicate if the expenditure is any type of financial aid. Uh, and then there's obviously definitions for each of those that are broken down, and we can get you more information on that distribution. Okay. And does it include the Iron Range Scholarship from the Permanent University Fund? Uh, Mr. Chair, yes. Okay. Okay, so then the last uh, chart I wanted to show you here on expenditures uh, is the change year to year in expenditures. And again, we track expenditures in so many different ways, but I think what's illustrative here is that our spending can uh, be quite variable and just as in any organization, some years hold some particularly high expenditures. So think about in years where we are implementing a large systems project, for example, or in years where we are transferring current funds over to fund capital projects, for example. Those types of things really skew the year-to-year -year change in expenditures. Um, and so you're gonna see some variability, but we do keep track uh, each year and try to understand what is driving our costs. I will tell you that we have some categories of spending that routinely every year uh, grow at rates faster than the rate of inflation, however you want to define inflation. Um, and we've listed some examples here. It doesn't mean that each item grows every year, but some, some of them do, uh, but some of them are more variable and in and some years grow um, exponentially. And it's just, it's just something that we have to deal with and it just makes balancing the budget a little more challenging uh, in trying to come up with the resources and redirect resources to those costs. It's part of our annual process of reviewing expenditures to figure out where we can cut back uh, in order to pay for cost increases. And we'll talk more about that here in the process slides, but uh, just wanted to show that here in the context of the annual change in, in expenditures. So, Moving on, so that's that's what I brought today for a really high overview of the budget and revenues and expenditures. And I was going to move to the budget process, but it, you, you have before, a you go, before you go on, so in your endowment slide, was the permanent university fund was that part of that endowment? Is that uh, yes, part of yes, Mr. Chair. Okay. Yes, Mr. Chair, it is. Okay. Yep. Okay, the budget process now and the budget model. This is really about how we uh, go about the process of making decisions uh, within the institution. So the questions we ask ourselves first, when we're, when we're going to plan for next year's budget, we put ourselves through an exercise of answering questions to help frame uh, a plan, if you will, or a set of plans. Many years we'll have different scenarios and models that we're running at the same time. But these are the types of questions that we ask ourselves in order to create that plan. On the resource side, we, we have to think about what's our strategy for tuition and enrollment. 
What do we want to achieve through uh, manipulating, if you will, the tuition rate and or the enrollment numbers? And where do we have the capacity to do that? We have to ask ourselves, what are our strategies for growing other revenues that we were talking about? Where can we do that? What's realistic? Uh, and how would we use that revenue? And then we also have to ask ourselves, how do we reallocate our existing set of resources from lower priority to higher priority? How do we make that an active part of balancing the budget? On the cost side, there are a handful of variables that we do have to address every year. One of them, the biggest one being compensation. What is gonna happen with our fringe benefit costs, particularly health healthcare costs is what has been increasing. And then what is a, a salary increase that we'd like to provide for our employees? That's a major one. We also have some costs that we don't really ask ourselves questions on other than what is it gonna cost us? Debt service, utilities, uh, those kinds of things that are kind of bit fixed and baked in. But then where we do have choice, what do we wanna put in the budget in, in the plan for an investment pool? for funding new opportunities and, and enhancements of program and that type of thing. What are the, what's happening with research and do we have to be uh, in tune with, do we need more infrastructure to support the growing research portfolio? Same thing with student services. Where are we, where are we, where's that extra edge we need to put into student services right now uh, to support the students and to uh, serve them better? And then very importantly, we ask ourselves again, that sort of the flip side of that, uh, what do we do with existing resources? Part of that is saying, what do we stop doing uh, in order to reduce expenses throughout the institution? That means we have to stop doing something um, to, do, to work smarter, yes, where possible, but often it's a scope question as well. What can we stop doing? So those are the really high level uh, questions that shape a plan at a 30,000 foot total university level. Here's our plan for next year. And then we work, uh, slide please. We work with each of our units during the budget process to bring that to life, to try to understand how to make it all balance. This is a list, and I won't go through all of these, but this is a list of our 50 budgeting units. Much like the state has state agencies, the university has what we call resource responsibility centers. Uh, it includes each of our system campuses, each academic unit on the Twin Cities campus. That's what you see over on the left of the line. And then we have a series of support units that either work just for the Twin Cities campus or work for system-wide um, interests. And this is the level of the institution that we meet with, that we hold accountable for the financial activity that occurs within it. Uh, and we'll talk more about, well, actually, let's go to the next slide, because the next slide is who is involved when we meet with those units. The president here is in the budget process, is the person who ultimately working with the board, working with the leadership, her leadership team, and others, develops the answers to those questions I was talking about for the budget, those high-level framework planning um, variables that we have to deal with. She's the one who sets that up. And then she delegates to what we call the budget committee, the budget process. We take those goals that are part of that framework, turn them into budget instructions, send those out to each of the 50 units on the prior page. And then we work with the chancellors, the deans, the vice presidents, the leaders of those units and in understanding their responses to the budget instructions. It's their um, responsibility to bring forth information on their challenges, financial challenges, on their financial opportunities. They bring forward proposals for budget cuts when we send them targets, and they bring forward information about how they think the university can operate uh, more effectively and efficiently and achieve our goals um, and priorities. So we work with them at that level to try to understand how the budget is sitting. Right, So it's almost like we build a budget for each one of those units individually and then add them up in the end. Each one of those uh, 50 units has a choice in how they involve their departments or the, the organizational levels below uh, them in this process. It is up to them how they want to do that. So some are heavily involved and some are not. Ultimately, through this process, it's an iterative process. We work back and forth with the president uh, to come up with her recommended budget that she then takes to the board for review and approval. Within that, we've got a couple more slides to help 
um, perhaps make this a little bit clearer. But within that process, we also have a tool that we call the budget model. And this is really a series of formulas that help us determine the allocation or attribution of revenues within the institution and the allocation of costs. Doesn't make all the decisions, but it's a starting point. So we'll walk you through this and then share some examples on the next slide uh, as I talk it through. In the budget model within the institution, all the revenues you see on the left here for earned revenues, they are attributed directly to the units that generate them. They don't come central, they don't come to the budget office or the president's office and get allocated out. They're recorded directly into the academic unit budgets, okay? In addition, the state, the o &M allocated state appropriation is a decision each year, but it's a it's done on an incremental basis, a base plus minus process, much like the state uses with our budget. We have a base appropriation and decisions are made to increase it or decrease it um, each year. Same thing here. We have a base for each one of our academic units. Every one of them receives state appropriation. We have a base amount there and we make decisions based on what's available to us um, to increase it when we can or to pull it back when we have to. Uh, but they all, but it all goes to the academic units. So in essence, 100% of the revenues of the institution almost are in the academic units, but that means they have to have 100% of the cost there as well. So they use that revenue to cover their direct costs for their faculty and their equipment, uh, for their student support services in their dean's office or what have you. And we have a series of formulas that take the costs so in the right box here on the chart and attribute them and allocate them to the um, academic units as an expense uh, based on different formulas. So every one of the support units, let's use the budget office as an example, the budget for the budget office uh, is actually in the bottom support service unit cost pool that you see here, and it gets charged out to our academic units based on their proportionate share of total expenditures but there's a different formula for each one of these nine cost pools in terms of distributing out those costs. And I just wanna say here that in the end, we wind up with, um, it, it's a tool, right? And we wind, wind up with a way to align the revenues associated with our mission dri driven activity in the academic units to align that with the fully allocated costs of delivering the mission through those same units. It's a tool we use, it makes the process easier, and I would argue it makes it more meaningful. It creates incentives in the budget, that incentives to grow revenue and incentives to reduce costs. Um, I could spend, I'm a budget geek, I could spend days talking about this, so I, I won't. Uh, but let me, let me try and finish this by tying this tool we have here back to the budget process and making decisions, which is on this last slide. Uh, go ahead, JD, yeah. I call this a three-legged stool for resource allocation. And it's pretty simple. There's, there's three, tool, three, three legs. I'm gonna start with the one on the bottom, that central decision-making process. As I mentioned, the president decides on those big budget variables for compensation and tuition and how much to ask for from the state and so forth. She decides those things through consultation. And then that becomes part of the second leg of the stool up on the left side, which is that set of uh, variables that we call our budget framework that provides the structure for balancing the budget and making decisions. So as we go through the process, we can compare, well, if we increase this, it means we have to decrease that, or you know, it, it has to offset each other somehow within that basic structure so we're balanced. The Senator, third Senator leg Klaassen. of the school then, Senator once we Klaassen. have that plan. Julie, oh, just a second. Senator Claussen, you have a question. Yeah. You're, uh, you're on mute. The old mute, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, why don't we have our presenter finish with this slide and then I'd like to go back one and I have a question. Okay. Okay. Okay, yeah, thank you. So the third leg of this stool, which we call the budget model, which is what I just described on the previous slide that we'll come back to. What that does is actually help us translate that high level framework 
down to the unit level. That's the level where really the, the meat of the institution is, and that's where it comes alive. So let me give you an example. Very simply, let's say in the budget framework up on the upper left, the president has decided we're gonna do a 1% tuition increase, we're gonna do a 1% salary increase, and she wants to add investment in the library. Very simple, those three things only. What the budget model does is say, okay, we're gonna do an increase in tuition by 1%. That means how much new revenue for our College of Liberal Arts, for example, on the Twin Cities campus. If we're gonna do a 1% salary increase, that means how much more expense. And if we're gonna invest in the library because of the budget model and the formula for cost allocation, we know how much that investment in the library is gonna cost the College of Liberal Arts. So we can just isolating in those three variables, we can look at the college and say, all right, you get this much amount of revenue and your costs are going up this much, where does that put you in terms of balancing? Are you short, are you gonna have a shortfall? or are you going to uh, have a surplus in that equation? It, through that process, and, and it's a lot more complicated than that because we bring in all the different revenues, all their challenges, all their requests for investment, all their proposals for budget cuts when we give them targets, and we have to put all those pluses and minuses together at that unit level to try to make them as successful as we possibly can. So in that process, we make decisions about the most appropriate distribution of the state money, which is not formulaic. It's an annual decision, as I mentioned, incremental, uh, but we make decisions about the best distribution of that based on what we have available. If we get an increase, we have to determine where it goes. If we get a cut in that appropriation, we have to determine where it comes out. And we use that all of those revenues combined because, it's, because it is the combination of all the revenues together that we need in order to manage in a way that will ensure we achieve our goals and make each unit as successful as we possibly can in the most efficient way possible. It's, it's complicated, it's difficult. Um, as you are aware with your work uh, at the state, we can't do everything we'd like to do and we certainly can't keep everybody happy. Um, I usually say a good budget is one in which they are sort of equally unhappy uh, because that's always the case. Uh, and that is true no matter what budget you're doing. People, it's never okay. enough. That was actually, uh, but we, that we was develop actually. a budget that we really feel confident in each year. That, uh, that was actually a political statement because we say the same thing around here. If nobody's happy, yeah. it's probably a good budget. Um, is that- is The academic units, and they use the revenues over on the left to, in combination to pay all their expenses plus that library charge. That's one of the expenses that they have. Uh, so it is charged out in that way. The only library that isn't part of that is the law school library. That is actually managed and stays within the budget for the law school. We have to do that for accreditation purposes for the law school. It has to be tied there instead of to the general library budget. Senator Clausen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, are there other examples of that where, where you uh, charge back to uh, departments? Yes, uh, Chair Thomasoni, Senator Klassen, all of our support unit costs are charged out. That's what this represents. So in other words, we don't, we put all of the revenues, the earned revenues here on the left and the state appropriation, we put them into our academic units, our colleges and our campuses. And then we take all of our support unit budgets and we, through formulas, we charge them back out to the academic units. So every academic unit is paying their quote, fair share of all of administration, all of um, research administration, all of our technology, infrastructure and services, our HR, our lawyers, our you know, university relations, everything is charged back out. I can imagine there's few uh, discussions about that with departments. <laughs> yeah, uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Clausen, I would argue that's one of the actually one of the benefits of this type of a budget model because they care now about what we are spending in all of those areas, and they can provide input, and we ask them for input on service levels as well. So when we're doing a technology infrastructure investment or some, some new thing in our Office of Information Technology, 
the units, the academic units, have the ability to provide input on whether that's a priority or not, or how it should be done, because they're paying for it. Um, another example is it provides a lot of incentives where, where possible. I mean, they can't really say much about how much I get paid necessarily, but they can um, make decisions that lower their costs. So they can choose to give up space, for example. The, the facility costs are based on assignable square feet. So if they have less assignable square feet, they will lower their costs. Um, the utilities, if they shut off their lights and turn off their air conditioning, their costs will go down, those types of things. Uh, and there's lots more examples, but th those are some of the benefits actually of this type of budget model. Very good, thank you. And, and just to follow up on that, I thought I heard you say that all of those allocated costs are based on a formula. And um, so what if the formula doesn't allow enough money to pay for the costs that are in each one of the allocated costs? Yes, uh, Chair Tomasoni, excellent question. The formula is to distribute. There's, there's a separate formula for each one of these, but it's only to distribute the cost. When we go through the budget process, we actually determine outside of a formula the the budget for facilities management for example what do we what are we going to give them to operate for next year and then whatever that total is the formula is used to distribute that total out to the units so we don't set a rate and a formula rate and then give facilities management whatever that generates it's the other way around. We first determine what they need to operate within our total available resources. And then that gets charged out through the formula. You take the total and you proportion it out based on the formula, based on the formula. Okay. Then one, then one other question about, we, we're back at the endowed chairs. The, um, so I, I, I'm a little bit familiar with the permanent university fund and I think there's, about 250 endowed chairs paid by that somewhere in that area. Um, and, and, and most of that money comes from um, mining revenues. And I'm just wondering um, how many endowed chairs are there, if you know that, and then um, that, that are funded by the, by the PUF funds. And then how are, how are these endowed chairs distributed across the campuses of the, of the university uh, for the purposes of their, um, whatever their, their, their specialties are. Uh, Chair Tomasoni, I unfortunately don't have the exact number. Again, we can get that for you. I was going to say it's somewhere between two and 300, but I, I, I don't hold me to that. We will get that information for you. Uh, it is the process to determine the endowed chairs based on, I mean, it is uh, a process through the provost's office and Provost Croson is here today if she wanted to add to that, but that is part of um, the portfolio of the provost. Okay, and and back to your semaphore. Um, so you have some, are any of the restricted funds um, restricted by a result of university policy? So um, you, you, you specifically mm -hmm. restrict yourself uh, from moving those funds to somewhere else because of your own policies. Uh, Mr. Chair, I would say it's not written in policy, but when I was mentioning, for example, that unrestricted funds from uh, some activities like the clinical income and the veterinary medical center, uh, technically speaking, I suppose we could move that money within the institution, but it is the practice that we do not do that. Uh, so that type of revenue there are certain practices, it's not necessarily written in policy, but there are certain practices that hold the funding within a unit. Uh, the only one I can think of where there's an actual policy right at the top of my head would be the royalty income. So when we have an invention uh, that is licensed and generates income, that income coming back into the institution, we have a policy that distributes the, that income one third to the inventor one third to the department that the inventor is a part of, and one third to our basic research infrastructure uh, in, in the vice president for research. That is in policy, that, so that is a restriction, uh, but the others are either restrictions placed on us by an external person or entity, or uh, we do have some practice um, that we follow, essentially. 
And then finally, this is my last question. I don't know if any of the other members have any other questions, but so when you have tuition, uh, that, that you, you showed the tuition on all the campuses, how much more did the students actually end up paying as a result of living expenses and room you know, room and board and books and whatever? Is it, is it double that or, or what's, what's, what's about, the, about the amount? Uh yeah, Mr. Chair, it isn't quite double right now in terms of the full cost of attendance. Uh, there is an official uh, cost of attendance figure that's calculated every year by campus. And in addition to the tuition, you add on top of that any mandatory fees, their housing, dining, miscellaneous expenses, which includes some travel, uh, books, those types of things. Uh, and I think right now it is, it isn't double, uh, but it's close to double. It's it's maybe another uh, 40, 45 percent on top. Okay. Uh, Senator Jasinski. Senator Thomas, if you want to see the amount, I'll show you my checkbook next time I'm around you. <laughs> so you know exactly how much it is? <laughs> uh, not the exact amount, but I have two students at UMD, as you well said, so I can share some of the cost with you. Okay. I want. I would love to see your checkbook, actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any other questions? Okay. Myron, do you have anything to add? Oops. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Chair Thomas. Sorry, thank you, uh, the other members. I'll just take one minute because I know we're ready to wrap up. I just wanted to Thank uh, Vice President Tonneson uh, for this presentation and the work she did putting this together. And let, I really me appreciate ask, let me ask you a question before you start. So sure. what's what's more important, associate vice president or senior vice president? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, you should, as you all know, uh, some of you I've known for a long time over the last several lives that I've lived. And through all the different things that I've done, there's only been one really thing, to the extent I've been successful, the only really thing I've done right is to make sure I have talented people around me. So in this case, the associate vice president means a lot more than senior just means I'm old, I think I would say right now. So, uh, but thank you for asking that question, Chair Thomas. You're probably, are you old enough to get your shot yet or did you get it already? Or? I am old enough to be on the list, but I have not gotten my shot yet. So I'm, I haven't gotten mine yet either. Okay, sorry, go ahead, Mark. No, that's fine, thanks. Uh, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, one of the things we're trying to do, because I know we're all mindful of cost, and in addition, as the president talked about several weeks ago to you all, we have a new 2025 plan, and we really want to make sure that as we drive the institution's future, we look toward making sure that the research, the teaching, and the service we do is is really world class and supports what Minnesota wants. And so what we are really doing right now is taking a look at making sure that the delivery of our services, uh, the, share, the, uh, the IT, the HR, the, uh, uh, all the different uh, services that we provide really are top notch and the most efficient possible. So we're engaged in a process to make sure we make those costs as, as, as best we can fit the model of supporting a world-class institution. So we'll, re we'll be reporting back to you more on that in the future, but I just wanted to let you know that we take the money that uh, the state gives us very seriously, and we thank you for that, the, the, um, the funds that you give to this university, and we want to make sure that you know we, we want to make sure we can use it as, effective, as effectively as we can going forward. That's all I really had, Chair Tomasoni. Thank you so much. Other questions or comments? So I can't ever resist, I, I, I can't resist mentioning the PUP funds again, you guys, because for those of you who are sitting there, you may not know this, but um, there's, a, there's, there's, a, there's a couple of funds. One's called the Minerals Research Fund. The other one is called the, the uh, Scholarship Fund. And those funds actually are derived from uh, royalties from mineral deposits on the Iron Range. And when, when the minerals are mined, the royalties are paid, and they're they're both, <coughs> excuse me, approaching fifty million dollars. And the uh, <clears throat> the scholarship fund is one that I think I'm, we're we're really really proud of because uh, upwards of three thousand students every single year get a two or three thousand dollar scholarship to all the various campuses, and it's called the Iron Range Scholarship because it came from the Iron Range. So uh, it's kind of our con contribution to the University of Minnesota. But the uh, the funds keep growing every year, and the, the, the minerals research funds are are also used at the uh, in, 
NRI in Duluth and the Coleraine Lab in Coleraine to do minerals research and to try and come up with the next and best uh, uh, way of doing things in the in the minerals industry. So um, we're pretty proud of that uh, coming from the, from northern Minnesota and, and the Iron Range. So I have to bring that up. There's there's a, there's a couple other uses for it, and one of them is the endowed chairs, and another one is for um, Masabi Range. Uh, uh, students to be able to go into the the industry. So uh, the, the the funds themselves have been uh, returning many times over to the to the university, and, and it's a pretty neat thing. So uh, with that, are there any other questions from the committee? And I don't see any. So um, you know where to get a hold of us if we we need more information. We know where to get a hold of you if if we if. If, if anything like this uh, comes up again, we'll be in touch as we go through the, uh, the budgeting process. And, uh, um, and uh, I think that was a very good presentation. So uh, thank you very much and uh, meeting adjourned.